And this is actually how you go about creating that resiliency in your microservices architecture, because yeah. now you can break communications with one service without actually impacting the entire service set. Hello and welcome to the Geeknetter podcast. I'm your host, Kaival Leapte, and I'm back with another interesting topic, interesting episode, and a very special guest. We are going to talk about service mesh, microservices, microservices communication, uh, the problems that service mesh solves, uh, how Istio solves all this problem, and basically all about cloud native 2.0 networking. So to help us understand all those interesting concepts and architecture of Istio, uh, we have uh, Marino with us uh, from solo.io. So uh, welcome. Uh, thanks a lot for joining us. And let's start with a brief introduction. Hey, hey, Kevalia, thanks so much for having me on this episode of the Geek Narrator. Honestly, when you reached out, it was a privilege. I know we bounced back and forth trying to lock in the time, but I'm, I'm glad we finally did. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Marino Ajay. I am a developer advocate. In fact, uh, you know, let me let me quickly share a bio screen so you can all see who I am. And I know you can see me on screen, but let me just yeah. uh, let me just pull this up here. So. That's me. Um, I'm a developer advocate that I just, like I just mentioned at Solo. Um, so what does that mean? So I am out, out in public. I'm talking about things around cloud native networking, around things like service mesh technologies, around microservices communications, just like Kevalia mentioned. Uh, and not only that, like I, I also have an extensive networking background. So um, there's a lot of different things I'll do. You'll find me a lot on Twitter. I uh, also stream on Twitch occasionally, and you get to see me like just get into like, I don't know, maybe deploying something or working with something within the Istio uh, framework. But yeah, I'm, you know, I'm really excited to be here. Um, you know, there's so much we could talk about today, but, you know, I'll, I'll pass it back to you. Awesome. Yeah, thanks for the introduction. And uh, as I said, I'm really excited because this is such a vast topic. And there are so many small details as well as complex things that uh, we have currently. Uh, so let's dive right in, right? So let's start with basic definitions and, you know, terms that we are going to use in the episode just to set the basic uh, stage for the audience. Uh, let's start with, you know, microservices, which is, you know, so, so popular these days, like everyone is using micro microservices architecture. And then there is this debate on monolithic architecture versus microservices. And there's new term as well, like ma macro services or something. There's a lot of debate on size of the microservice. So microservice is a, like a vast topic and it's so popular these days. So let's define, uh, how would you like describe in your view, what is a microservices architecture? Yeah, so I, I will, I'll start with me jumping into the world of containers and Kubernetes, um, because to me at this point, a container is that unit of compute that we work with, but it's actually, you know, a partial definition of a microservice. So that microservice um, is just, you know, this little tiny function that does something as a part of your, your larger app. But what's really interesting about microservices and, and the architecture of them is that they're independent of each other. Right. There's no like dependency or, or coupling of hey one service to another, much like we used to see with uh, you know code that we used to compile and run back in the day. So you would write all of your functions in one massive blob of code and then fire that off for compilation and then run it. But then when you need to change something in your application, you're having yeah. to recompile again. Microservices offer a much more alternative approach where things are broken up into pieces, right? Tiny, tiny pieces. And now you can change these tiny pieces independent of other tiny pieces. And that's how we achieve microservices architecture. Um, but the interesting thing about this though, is there's resiliency built into a lot of this. What that means is one microservice going down or disappearing shouldn't take down the rest of your application. It should continue to function. Um, and so, you know, when I go back to this idea of let's think about containers and Kubernetes, it's the current standard that we use today to be able to run a microservices architecture. Um, we'll write, you know, very small snippets of code, um, run them inside of a container, deploy multiple containers, have them connect to each other, and then that forms our application. And here's the interesting part, you know, now we'll, we'll relate 
microservices to this idea of APIs, because now everything is going to provide you an API. What's an API, by the way? It's just a, a way to interface with your application. But because all of these microservices offer up an API, we also need to consider how we connect to them, how we secure them, how we observe what they're doing, um, and then you know route to the right API when we need to. Yeah, that that, that makes sense. And uh, yeah, thanks for you know defining that architecture in a very simple uh, to understand manner. Uh, as you as you mentioned, you know there are so many of these small functions deployed as small containers, and they talk to each other over APIs. And, you know, if I have, you know, one monolithic arch architecture, there's just one component to manage, but now there are like tens of or hundreds of components, depending on the size of your application and what use case you're solving. So definitely there are going to some challenges that I have to, you know, uh, in, that I encounter during the process of deployment and, you know, uh, maintenance of those microservices. Of course, there are so many benefits, as you mentioned, that they are loosely coupled, they can scale separately, you know, you don't have to touch uh, the entire application if you just want to change one feature and all that. Uh, so what are the challenges that you have seen in your experience with microservices architecture? Well, there, there are a number of them. Um, one of them is around security and trust. Uh, you deploy a microservice yeah. and it needs to talk to another microservice. Or let's, let's even remove the term micro and just call them services now. Services. This, um, when you have service-to-service -service communication, there is an assumption that this this service that's talking to another one is going to do a number of activities, but in a trusted sense. But who's verifying that trust? Who's making sure that this service is exactly who they say they are, and mm -hmm. they're not trying to do anything malicious to the other service? Yeah. Um, and so that's one concern. The other concern is connectivity. Like, how do you connect to these services? How do I mm -hmm. find where the service is? and communicate with it, which is another challenge in itself because it kind of stems from the concept of networking and how that's achieved in the world of um, microservices. Um, there's scaling issues. Okay, when I scale this one service, how do I continue to serve up traffic to all of these duplicated services or multiple yeah. copies of it so that I still get efficiency out of it? Uh, but I also can ensure that my application is responding in the way it should be at that scale level. So there's that concern as well. And then the other thing too is microservices come and go very quickly. And that's just the nature of how we consume them today. You know, in the world of Kubernetes, when a pod comes, it may be very short lived and it might disappear. But when, you know, that same function of that pod comes back again, it's going to have a different IP. It's going to have a different, you know, potential way to connect to it. So how do we account for that? And yeah. DNS or domain name services becomes something very critical that we also need to maintain, especially when we're operating in this microservices architecture. Yeah, th that makes sense. And, you know, as you said, uh, this is the cloud era where we have, you know, a lot of control over how we manage our resources at a very high level though, not at the low level. So we can always like create new containers, scale them up, scale, scale them down. And, you know, we don't have access or, control over, you know, giving them, let's say the same IP addresses, it's all dynamic, it's all elastic. Uh, so what is the, what is the solution that we have? Because of course it is being more popular, more people are, you know, evolving or adopting microservices. So th there needs to be some solution that is making it easier for them. So what, what, uh, in your view is, is the solution for this problem? So there, before I get into that solution, I want to call it one more problem, and it's the ability to see what's actually going on with all of these mm. services and how they communicate. Um, yeah. So there's this element of when you're when you're operating production environments, you actually need to understand how the infrastructure is performing, how your applications are performing, if they're actually responding from an HTTP standpoint, and you know the HTTP checks are coming down correctly, and you're seeing that your application is healthy. So that's observability. Now, all the different challenges I laid out, including observability, how do we solve this? Well, there, there are a lot of different ways, right? Um, there is the way of let's go to the open source community or the cloud native community and pick out a bunch of different tools, uh, you know, try to make them all work together and boom, now we have a solution. I, I could like literally go to the CNCF landscape and we could probably dig into a whole different number of tools out there. But here's the reality, right? Like, you know, if, if you go to attempt this yourself, 
there might be some level of technical debt that you've created in your yeah. in your production environment or even your test environment. Yeah. Now, uh, there are a lot of ways you can achieve this. There are also proprietary ways that you can achieve this. Let's say you're using a cloud provider. They have solutions that can allow you to do this, except it'll, it disallows you from using external solutions. It mm. creates a very locked-in system. So yeah. in the open source world, there was a, a very good way to approach this, except it became very complex to manage and scale. Um, and that solution was using something like a proxy. Um, mm. If you're familiar with Envoy, it's a proxy that was able to live alongside your application and then tell you what that application was doing. But having to do this at scale was not very easy to manage, easy to operate. And as a result, this concept of service mesh came to be. So service mesh just basically took Envoy or took on proxies like Envoy and enhanced its capabilities to be able to provide things like traffic management. You know, how do I get to my service? How do I communicate with it? Um, yeah. The resiliency. So if service fails, well, I can recover from it and then also still make sure that the path to get to it is there. How do I make sure that I can see my microservices and know what they're doing? Uh, and then finally, how do I provide a zero trust like architecture for all those services without having to tinker with each one manually? So service mesh is effectively the way to go. And this is that solution. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Uh, so there are a couple of terms we, we have used so far. Uh, one is definitely cloud native. So let's also define what do we mean by cloud native? And the other one was, you know, zero trust. So uh, can we yeah. define these two terms? Uh, sure. So cloud native is the idea of being able to take advantage of cloud-like principles, but wherever you're you're, you're consuming mm. them. So whether you're doing this on premise or you're doing this in, in a cloud environment or at an edge environment for that matter, you're still taking advantage of those cloud principles, usually elasticity, scale, resiliency, portability, uh, and even extensibility. And there, there are probably other pillars as well in the cloud native space. But this idea is like, okay, I want a cloud-like experience, but I want to build it mm -hmm. myself using the best of the breed of services out there. Uh, yeah. And so I will go to the open source world that has developed all these different solutions for me. Um, Kubernetes is a cloud native technology because mm -hmm. it's giving you cloud-like capabilities inside of this platform that effectively you're just running on Linux, right? Except it's yeah. not someone else's Linux, it's your Linux, right? Yeah. Um, so that's the cloud native definition. And I'm sure that there are much more components to it. Um, hey, do you want to fill in the gaps? I mean, is there anything else you want to add to that definition? No, I think it makes sense that, you know, uh, wherever you're deploying, uh, having those cloud principles uh, into your architecture, like support natively, uh, so that you don't have to, you know, have like a workaround uh, around the cloud principles. Uh, so I think it makes sense and Q Kubernetes makes it easier for us to, you know, configure these things and, you know, quickly do something like that. Uh, so I think it makes sense. Uh, so let's, let's then move to the zero trust, uh, uh, architecture. And then I have a question for you, uh, on, on the problems that Envoy had. Yeah, absolutely. So zero trust architecture. And what that means is literally, I am not trusting you at all, not trusting anything at all. That's all it really yeah. simply means. But mm -hmm. that's derived from the fact that we know about all the all the components that exist in our application that need to talk to each other. And yep. then we're, we're affixing identity to these components. So we know we have exact details on who's to yeah. talk to who. Uh, but not only that, right? We have to authorize these services. We mm -hmm. have to authenticate them. So what yep. I mean by authenticate them, that's that verification. Can I trust you? Are you a valid member that's able to do something here. And if mm -hmm. you are, then absolutely, you're authenticated. But then the next step is authorization, right? Okay, now that you're authenticated, what are you even allowed to do? Are you allowed to actually scale pods? Are you allowed to inject a sidecar? Are you allowed to just even get resources and know what's going on in the cluster is really the authorization part. It's basically yeah. a set of rules allowing or disallowing you from doing certain things. And usually these align with like HTTP get operations. Now there's also the element of accounting and auditing. Okay. Now you have a record of who did what, because that becomes highly critical into, you know, establishing a zero trust architecture. 
but it's yeah. effectively, you know, this, prin uh, you know, aligning to this principle of least privilege, allowing you to use a uh, role based access control or attribute based access control so that you're locking down your system so that there is limited touch points, limited potential for something to go wrong for a for some malicious attacker to do something into your environment. So yeah. zero trust effectively is, you know, disallowing you from simply just doing something, hopping into the cluster and saying, hey, I'm, I'm going to you know, take control and do what I want to do. Um, mm -hmm. It's an architecture that, you know, a lot of environments strive to achieve because ultimately, you know, uh, you know, if you deploy Kubernetes and then you deploy some services and you're expecting to run an application, that's not secure by default. Yeah. yeah. Right. There are a lot of insecure elements about that, but that's, you know, an entirely separate conversation. Um, anyways, I hope that defines the zero trust, zero trust architecture for you. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think that makes sense. Uh, just to make it a little more, you know, just with an example to make it a little more realistic so our viewers can connect to it. I just want to take an example. So let's say I have a e-commerce application and, uh, so it's like a set of microservices that I have. So there's, of course, uh, like a product page, uh, let's say product service, and then there is uh, a card service, then I have a billing service, payment service, order management service, and all that. So these services communicate to each other, and it's behind like a firewall, right? Because uh, for, for external services, or external users to interact with your services, you are, let's say on HTTPS, but internally they are, you know, talking to each other on HTTP. And then uh, does zero trust or the role-based access uh, mean that, let's say for example, payment service can is not allowed to create an order, uh, but only let's say the card service is allowed to create an order or the order management services is allowed to create a payment, but not, uh, vice versa, or card cannot directly talk to payment. So is that what we mean by role-based access? Exactly. And that's well aligned with the authorization principle, right? You're effectively yeah. allowing or disallowing certain services from doing other things to other services as well. And this is a, a, a this is an approach, a strategy that effectively everyone is working towards, primarily because, you know, you deploy thousands and thousands of services and they're doing yeah. so many different things. Um, but if you don't apply any sort of mechanism to, to authorize, right. Mm. Let alone authenticate, right. Authorize. That's another layer that we're trying to defend against, right. Preventing yeah. something yeah. from going wrong, which you could, you could, it could be as simple as you have a service that's telling another service to scale when it hits a certain threshold. Well, what happens when it scales and you haven't addressed the underlying infrastructure and now you've yeah. hit capacity, right? Yeah. This is part of the reason we have authorization policies in place to prevent any sort of denial of service, even like just that's been developed internally from just the mm. service itself, right? Yeah. So th that exactly to your point, right? It, role based access control aligns with how services can communicate and do things to other services. Okay. That makes sense. Uh, you mentioned while describing what is a service mesh that, you know, it solves the problem that proxies like Envoy had. So I want to dig a little deeper there. Uh, what, what problems, uh, so you mentioned that it is difficult to maintain it at a very high scale. Uh, so what was the problem and how does it work that it had this problem? So Envoy, um, Envoy is very powerful. It's constructed and it was built on C. Um, but the, the thing about Envoy is that you imagine you had this device that you wanted to program, mm. but every time you had a service that you wanted to program it for, you had to do this every time, right? And then anytime Envoy had a vulnerability, you had to manually go update the Envoy container or whatever it is yourself. Yeah. That, yeah. that was one main issue. The other thing too is having to write your own filters to define what you're looking for is another challenge in itself. If you, you know, haven't worked with, with Envoy that much, right. As a proxy, um, it takes a lot of work to develop those filters. So what, what ended up happening was it, it's like, we already have uncovered the common use cases that we would actually want to write filters for, for Envoy. 
Yeah. Why not create a standardization against that for the, the mm. common things that we're looking for is exactly yeah. how something like Istio was born. Istio, a service mesh was born. So this is also related to this decoupling of a control plane from a data plane too. Envoy on its own is like a control plane data plane, which means mm. you have to do this individually for each Envoy that you deploy. If you decouple that function of control plane and leave Envoy as just a data plane and program this elsewhere from a central point and then push it to the relevant Envoy instances, then you've achieved a good level of scale. Yeah. This is how Istio is doing it today. This is effectively the Istio service mesh. Yeah. I think it makes sense. Uh, you mentioned two two more terms here, like control plane and data plane. I think these terms itself are, you know, self-explanatory, but uh, let's add a little more uh, to it. Like, what do we mean by control plane and what do we mean by data plane? Yeah, so a long time ago, if you've ever played with a, uh, a router or a switch, this device, right, that moves packets around in some way, shape or form, yeah. Now, to manage it, you have to either SSH into it or use a console cable. And then the other thing, too, is if you wanted it to make decisions, you have to program those decisions inside that device. Mm -hmm. And then that device, based off of those decisions you told it to honor, will move packets around accordingly. Yeah. So when you break this down, how I manage it, how I log into that device, is called a management plane. The decisions I tell it to make is the control plane because it has to use protocols to make those decisions. It has to calculate things and then decide how to route this packet. And then the ability to just, you know, understand those electrical signals and then move data around is the data plane. So in this router, you have a management plane, a control plane, and a data plane. The problem with something like this is having to individually manage this entity hundreds of times over basically lost itself over time because of inefficiency, because of automation and whatnot. So yeah. here we are in 2022, where we've decoupled the management plane. It's, it's still there. It's an API front end now. We just you know authenticate against it. Now we have this control plane where when we tell it, when we pass a YAML to say, this is how we want it to look, honor this, that's our control plane. It's basically negotiating things on our behalf. It's making yeah. decisions for us. It houses all the protocols, it's deciding. It's effectively the, the governor inside of that system. Now, the data plane is where everything moves, right? Mm -hmm. This is effectively a high functioning highway, right? I will move cars and trucks around, that's the data plane, but I yeah. don't make the decisions. I just, I just have been told this is how I'm gonna move data around. The mm -hmm. decisions are like our traffic lights. The control plane is like our traffic lights oh, okay. and our government is what comes in and decides, Hey, this is how our traffic lights are going to look, how they're going to operate on this timer based off of the traffic flow, et cetera. Right. Much like, yeah. much like a network system. Right. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, that's effectively how we distinguish what a data plane versus a control versus a control plane is. Yeah, that makes sense. And I, I like that analogy actually, uh, traffic signal and the highway part. So interesting. Uh, great. So, now we know that what problems, so we started off with microservices, just to kind of summarize a bit. We started off with microservices. We talked about the benefits and the challenges that we face and how we are, uh, you know, currently solving these challenges in a more cloud native manner. And then we define terms like cloud native, uh, zero trust architecture, uh, data plane, control plane, uh, what is a service mesh? We talked about Envoy and its, you know, limitations at uh, scale and, you know, how to, how it makes it difficult to manage. Uh, let's talk about, you know, service mesh itself. Like how is it solving that problem that Envoy had? And then let's slide over to Istio and let's, uh, you know, deep dive into Istio. Absolutely. Um, so a service mesh, what is a service mesh? So it actually aims to achieve the challenges that you would face in things like traffic management between services that need to communicate with each other as well as being able to provide you a platform for observability so you can see how your microservices are performing from a networking standpoint. And yeah. then finally, there, there's, a, well, I shouldn't say finally, there's a third thing that it does, and it gives you the platform to achieve zero trust. Um, the very last thing a service mesh is going to do is give you extensibility to do other things. 
things that might be custom for your own needs for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. But at a very base level, like here are some key things that you would want inside of, let's say, your Kubernetes architecture. Now, here's, here's a few examples as to why. With respect to traffic management, um, in Kubernetes, for example, you could use something called services networking, which allows you to expose each one of your apps inside of your cluster. Except when you have a lot of different applications, having to manage all different load balancer instances, picking the right ports becomes very challenging. Um, yeah. And it also becomes very costly too. So welcome, and we, we introduced this concept of ingress networking and even the gateway API, which effectively streamlines streamlines a lot of this capability, which centralizes this to using fewer load balancer instances and whatnot. But now you, you've actually saved yourself a lot of hassle and you can define how your services communicate to the external world, vice versa, using ingress. Now, except here's the other thing, you have different um, different applications running in different namespaces. You have applications that need to communicate with each other within your cluster. Um, and then not only that, you have applications that need to communicate outbound, maybe to, you know, services that exist in another cluster. Um, and so now you have this situation where communication becomes a lot more challenging. Mm. There's this other element here, right? Where if you're familiar with the Kubernetes container, um, uh, container, sorry, not container, certificate service. Um, I think it's the certificate service. I can't remember what the R stands for. CSR. It's the Kubernetes CSR process. Oh, certificate service request process. Okay. So that process is basically you're, you're trying to create a certificate that you can inject into a pod so that it can establish some level of trust. This is the TLS mm -hmm. certificate, by the way. Now, Having to do this for each one of your pods inside of a cluster is not scalable. It's very manual. You can automate it to a degree. You can use tools like Cert Manager and even um, other external tools to be able to help with this, but it still doesn't yeah. give you what you're looking for, right? It's not the entire picture. This is where a service mesh does come in because it is able to inject those certificates for you for your pods. Um, in addition to rotating those certificates. So when they expire, now a new cert comes into the process and you don't have to go go through that process again and worry about expired certificates, which means you also create a level of security as well, because once you invalidate a certificate, it's no longer usable, right? Mm -hmm. So you could, all, you could adjust that window and, and whatnot. Now, the other thing with, with this platform is that you're thinking about the security side of it uh, in terms of certificates. So that's the identity piece. What about the authorization piece? Having to construct authorization within Kubernetes manually becomes very challenging because now you have to go determine um, all of these different services that exist. You can't just simply define it for the ones that you want um, yeah. and it becomes a challenge, right? You may even have to use external tools manually, like, you know, let's say open policy agent and then um, define your, your authorization policies manually. But a service mesh is actually gonna give you that layer because that sidecar, that sidecar resource, something that is actually related to Envoy, actually is basically Envoy at this point, is something that's injected to a pod to run alongside your main container. And that becomes the point of where I inject certificates, where I do traffic routing, where I do mm -hmm. service discovery, how I gain observability, how I'm able to authorize services to communicate with each other. It's effectively a router that I sit right next to its service. But I've done that for all my, my microservices that I want to participate into a service mesh. Actually, this concept was something that Lyft did a while back. They actually rolled their own service mesh using Envoy um, and built very similar functionality to what you saw with Istio, yeah. the Istio service mesh. Interesting. So yeah, I, I think you mentioned some of the, you know, problems that, or some of the features that, uh, you know, service mesh provides you, uh, that otherwise are very hard to achieve, or there are ways to do it, but there are, you know, some third party tools that you have to use and it's, it's very cumbersome process. Uh, so yes, it, it makes sense to, you know, use service mesh and get all these features. Uh, 
but how how does it work like where does the configuration live for example if we just talk about traffic routing right so where where the control plane lives uh, and how how does the architecture look like yeah so let me go ahead and share my screen again so i could show you just a brief architecture of how this all looks yeah uh, share screen window here we go okay so if you can see my screen here right what yeah. we're looking at is a, a let's say a kubernetes environment with istio the istio service mesh deployed into that same environment now yeah. when you actually look at this in detail inside of a cluster it you'll see you know more specifics about it um but here's your control plane istio has a control plane called istio d now yeah. that control plane is is fed configurational information that we provide it now there are several several different things you would configure there's something called a virtual service there's something called a destination rule there's something called an authorization policy there's something mm -hmm. called a, a peer authentication policy um and then there's also other elements like external services that you can define or service entry which you can define for reaching more static resources now okay. You're going to use a virtual service to tell tell your services how to communicate with other services, or tell the mm -hmm. external world how to communicate with your service. You're going to use a destination rule to basically define, you know, what happens when traffic arrives at this destination. What do I want to do with it? Do I want to rate limit it? Do I want to um, shape it, traffic shape it in some way so that I can provide some buffer? Right. The peer authentication tells me hey, if this service has MTLS enabled and I want to communicate with it, I also need MTLS enabled, which is a strict policy. And then the authorization policy comes in to basically say, that, and these are all YAML configurations, by the way. Okay. The authorization okay. policy is saying service A, which can be a pod running the Envoy proxy as well as its main container, can only do certain actions against service B. Now, yeah. is, the Istio control plane um, is made up of something called Istio D, which when you, when you actually communicate with the Kubernetes API, right? When you run a kubectl um, apply-f and you pass in, let's say a uh, virtual service YAML configuration, the Kubernetes control plane understands that because it understands the Istio CRDs that exist. These are custom resource definitions that Istio has deployed upon installation. And yeah. Kubernetes understands that. Kubernetes now knows how, how to apply that it'll apply it to the cluster and then a virtual service configuration is now recognized and now you have traffic management in place. Okay, very interesting. Uh, so, sorry, you want to add something more? No, 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 go ahead. Okay, so uh, if I look at this, you know, architecture diagram, uh, how it works. So I see that Istio control plane called Istio D, if I get it right. Uh, Correct. It's it's living in the you know Kubernetes control plane, right? And then the Envoy proxy it is living as a sidecar with the service itself, right? So is is the Envoy proxy the data plane here, or how how, do, how does it work? Exactly. So okay. in Service A, right? Service A is actually a pod, uh, and mm. Service A has a container which which is Service A, and it has yeah. Envoy as a proxy, uh, we call it the Istio proxy um, when you actually yeah. look at the configuration. Um, Envoy itself is the data plane, like you just said. It's going okay. to receive its configuration directly from the Istio control plane, which is Istio D. So this okay. configure, oops, sorry. You're gonna receive, you're gonna receive Istio D's configuration. Um, yeah. You're also going to receive certificate information because Istio mm. D is also issuing certificates. Yeah. And Istio D is also going to tell the Envoy proxy where another service might exist. Yeah. So it's kind of like a name service routing service that Istio D is providing at this point. Okay. Now Envoy, okay. Envoy has, you know, its configuration set from a filter standpoint. So it mm. only just needs configurations that you're providing Istio for it to go and process. So there might be a, an HTTP connection filter that says, I'm, I'm going to allow myself to communicate with service B on this given port, on this given HTTP, TCP port. Yeah. And, you know, on this particular host address. And that's all I'll do. Um, but that actually isn't something that we can, we don't configure Envoy directly. We configure Istio. Istio translates that configuration into an Envoy configuration and passes it to the Envoy proxy. 
versus us having to configure Envoy directly. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And uh, so as, as I can see here, you know, the, the proxy is talking to the other proxy. So basically service A only knows about the Envoy proxy that is running as a sidecar. And it, it, it is decoupled with any other like outside world basically, right? So they, they don't know that there is a service B, they just know that there's a sidecar and I have to talk to sidecar and it will take care of the, you know, configuration. Exactly. So okay. what's really interesting about that is let's just say I decommissioned service A, but I left the sidecar proxy up. I could say to the sidecar proxy, hey, if there are requests coming in, you could do a number of things. You could time out those requests. You could circuit yeah. break and say, I don't exist. We're not found. Yeah you know, redirect, or you could even redirect for that matter and send the traffic elsewhere because the service isn't alive. And this is actually how you go about creating that resiliency in your microservices architecture, because yeah. now you can break communications with one service without actually impacting the entire service set yeah. or your entire application. That makes sense. And all this is happening by just injecting some, you know, YAML files basically. So as a developer, uh, if I have to do something, I just have to write some YAML files and, you know, inject them using some Kubernetes commands. And then internally it will take care of, you know, passing the right information to the data plane. And then it will, you know, take care of the communication. Uh, is it, is it tightly coupled to Kubernetes or there are other, you know, uh, platforms like Kubernetes that also supports this? So the way uh, Istio was designed was it was primarily designed for Kubernetes. Um, mm -hmm. it, it also has been extended to accommodate for virtual machines as well. Okay. Uh, and, and this is great because this creates a lot of transitionary paths for people like who run a lot of virtual machines today, but want to move into a microservices architecture and mm -hmm. something like a, a service mesh from Istio or by Istio actually allows this. So it makes it seem like your virtual machine is now part of the mesh. It can participate in things like mutual TLS, um, yeah. and we can even wrap to those per particular virtual machines as well. Interesting. And uh, the other question I had was, uh, does service B needs to be like a separate entity than service A, or it can also be uh, like a, just a different instance of service A itself? So if, if we have service A and another instance of service A and it had a sidecar resource, now there's a, there's a few ways to look at this, right? In the world of Kubernetes, if service mesh wasn't around, right? Yeah. And we actually scaled up our application, mm. we would have three copies of it, right? Now, yeah. if we scaled up service A, we would have three copies of service A. Each one would have its own sidecar. Yeah. Now, what that just simply means is that Kubernetes load balancing takes effect first anyways, because any available service will respond to that request. And any available pod in that service um, yeah. that's mapped to that service will respond to that request. Now, if you're talking about versions, right? Let's say we have service A is version one and service A or service B is actually version two of service A, right? Mm. You can actually set up a policy to do things like a canary deployment or a blue greens deployment yeah. where your service A um, might be fully alive and active and accepting traffic. Service B might be just alive, but not yeah. processing any traffic, but yeah. we can we can sequentially or in a manner of a cyclical way, actually s s shift the, the traffic towards service B. So now users are able to take advantage of that new feature that we've populated into the application. Yeah, that makes sense. So it gives me like a way to roll out my changes in a more incremental fashion so I can just Let's say I can say, uh, okay, for this version, just uh, redirect to 10% of the requests that are coming to this version. And then the 90% would still go to the old one. And I would still have the observability in the new version. And if everything is fine, I can slowly move to the, and all of this is happening with YAML files, right? Yes, yes, you actually okay. can use, um, so you'll use virtual services and define something called subsets within the virtual services and more details yeah. inside of the destination yeah. rules to be able to do this as well. And what you can end up doing is assign weights, like basically percentage weights. Yeah. Uh, you could do a shift of 50-50, you could do a shift of 30 to service A and 70 to service B. Uh, yeah. But these can define your different versions of your application. In fact, these could even be the same instance and you could just override Kubernetes load balancing if you wanted to 
and make these seem like they are two separate services, although they are actually doing the same thing. Now, there might be an interesting um, application here where now you're talking about global availability, right? Yeah. So you might use concepts like locality routing to route to service A because it exists locally yeah. to you. It's latency might be lower. But if, for example, service A didn't exist, you could route to service B, which is still service A, just in another location. That makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, just just want to add a little more clarity. Uh, so when so this this makes a lot of sense. I have service A, service B. I, I can also have different versions of service A. What if I have the same version of service A, but just two hosts, but they are like slightly different in a way that let's say service A is the leader and service uh, A, the next instance or the other instance is not the leader, but they have to communicate to each other, but they are the same service basically serving the same version. So how, how is that distinguished uh, in, in this? So there's a few ways you can, you can actually distinguish it using labels if you really wanted to. Okay. Um, and quite honestly, Kubernetes labels are still honored in the world of Istio. You actually okay. should use labels where you can so that you can provide mm -hmm. some more definition as to what this service might be doing as opposed to that one. So if they even need to communicate with each other, even if they are similar, there's a distinguishing nature of those services using those label features. Yeah. Okay. And then I can also configure something like, uh, let's say the leader goes down. So the, the failover mechanism for the replica to be the leader and all that and all happening exactly. through the YAML files. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. And that, that is part of the, the fault injection or fault capability. So when you, when you actually have a fault occurring in your environment, that's an indicator to reroute the traffic towards another available resource. If that primary service failed, much like in, okay. your, in your example. Okay. Very interesting. Just out of curiosity, uh, since we are talking about different versions here, so whenever we have these different versions, we do a lot of A-B testing just to, you know, uh, figure out which version is, you know, let's say, uh, ending up having more orders or, you know, performing better in a way. So we have some metrics around and we deploy, let's say, two versions. And we, using some configuration, we uh, do this routing. So what kind of metrics uh, is it giving me uh, for free? So all these metrics uh, live at the sidecar um, and some of these can be TCP based, but they can also be the requests um, and how quickly they've been responded to. So you're able to understand the latency in that request. Specifically, um, let's say for a given trace, we're able to understand between your request and the response that you receive, there might be several mm. microservices in between, right? And yeah. we might be trying to understand where along that microservices path did we see higher latency? Why did we see higher latency? Was that particular service being called upon much more frequently by other resources? Mm. And that caused a spike in latency, which means our overall request time took a lot longer to give us a response, right? Um, yeah. And so that, that, that detail actually lives at the sidecar. And there are a number of ways we can actually pull that detail out. We can do so manually by actually obviously logging into the sidecar resource, which is just Envoy, and just doing um, basically a dump of the statistics of the Envoy statistics just to tell us what's going on. Yeah. Um, or we can use tools, tools like Jaeger to basically tell us about the trace the request flow uh, or something like Kiali to show us or visually show us that request flow and even tell yeah. us about, you know, any sort of latency in the path or any sort of failed responses or, or failed requests for that matter. Yeah. Yeah. That is, that is very interesting. Uh, great. Uh, I think we, we have covered a lot of, you know, information here, but I think the key is that I can inject my configurations uh, from the outside in a simple YAML format. And then the control plane will actually take care of, you know, configuring the, the proxies or the sidecars, which is the data plane. And services are totally decoupled from each other. They don't know that it exists. They just talk to the sidecars. Uh, if, I, if I talk about, so let's say I create this cluster. I have the control plane. I have the first version of my YAML file. And what, what happens, uh, is, it, is it cached? Uh, in a way on the data plane, or does it always get the latest value from uh, from the control plane? 
or when is it updated? Is there a is there a possibility that as soon as I update my YAML file, there's some latency in updating across, let's say I have 100 machines. So how, how is that handled, the, the communication? That is going to be entirely dependent on a lot of different factors, right? Um, yeah. For one, if you have tons of microservices operating and the configuration that you applied has to apply to all of them, well, I expect, you know, it to take some time. I can't really say how much, but it can take some time for all of those resources yeah. to be fully updated before they start providing a new response or start doing something different. Um, yeah. And that could also highly depend on the system, the underlying system that you're running on. Does it have enough CPU yeah. and memory? Because now basically the operating system has to process a lot of this as it's receiving the configuration. Heck, you know, when you actually send that configuration in, depending on how large that configuration might be, it might take time for the Kubernetes API to process that as well. Um, mm -hmm. So it's it's very hard to determine when this will all take place. But here's the reality, right? Like a change that massive actually shouldn't happen. You should be doing smaller incremental changes, whether it's to code or to the underlying, you know, architecture that's supporting these applications if you're running a service mesh, if you're trying to make a change, it shouldn't be, you know, system wide or anything. Yeah. It should be yeah. very incremental, right? Mm -hmm. um, especially if you're, if you have multiple applications are probably distributed across various namespaces, you would probably deploy your new change, not immediately to your production environment. You probably stage it in like a test environment first, see how it operates. You'd actually discover at that point, if the system just falls over because you just didn't have enough resources to handle that level of change. Let's just say you're relabeling a thousand resources. Um, that could take time, right? Or it could be mm. very quick, depending on yeah. how busy the Kubernetes API is and how many other jobs it's working through at that point in time. There's so many factors here. It really yeah. is hard to tell, but something like that obviously would undergo some level of design and consideration before you even got to that stage, right? Yeah, yeah, that, that makes sense. So it is, even if you have all these amazing tools and frameworks, there are still some best practices to follow and you, you can't expect like everything would work even if you don't follow the best practices. So that makes a lot of sense. Uh, since we are talking about, you know, uh, the configuration non traffic routing and can I do also do some fault injections because I love to do chaos testing. And uh, at my work, I have some tools uh, that, you know, the, the teams have built to inject some failures. So failures like, let's say, um, network uh, latency. So I can inject like 100 millisecond more latency to this particular route. Or I can just say, just give me 500. Or I can just say, uh, fail 10% of the uh, requests, but pass 90% of the requests just to get each of the cases covered and understand the behavior of my application. So I believe this can also be used directly for chaos testing, right? Yes, there are actually platforms out there that have already gone ahead and pre-configured a bunch of automation that'll go out, scan your services inside of your cluster, and even build a plan out for you to do some chaos testing as well. Um, but normally, actually, Istio itself provides that fault injection capability right away. In yeah. fact, here's a here's a great, like, you could take a look at this article here. I'll share it with you. Um, it's one of the tasks inside of the Istio documentation um, where it actually walks you through deploying a sample application after you've deployed Istio into, let's say, a cluster like Kind or or even K3s or even like even a cloud Kubernetes service, it doesn't matter. As long as you have access to a load balancer, um, then you should be able to do a lot of this. But the fault injection basically allows you to inject delays into your application so that you can you can basically simulate failures that occur, right? Mm -hmm. And then elicit particular responses. So just to your point, you can do some true resiliency testing just to make sure that your application responds or parts of your application respond in an appropriate amount of time. But I, yeah. you know, to get into the details, I highly recommend that y'all go take a, take a look at this particular doc right here um, yeah. and even test out the task itself. Yeah, interesting. Uh, yeah, so I think we are pretty much clear on what is a service mesh, how does it work? What is the control plane? What is the data plane? How can we inject new configuration and what are the features it provides? Let's go a little bit deep into Istio's architecture. So as I understand, Istio is just an implementation of the service mesh concept. 
but how does it do it? Why is it different from other solutions? Yeah, so Istio is is actually pretty special because it's been developed by Google, but it's also been uh, very, very um, contributed to by a variety of companies out there. More specifically, like, for example, today, Solo is one of the top contributors into the Istio project because it works to enhance its capabilities. Yeah. Um, it works to be able to get to a point where we can even extend what Istio can do. But at a, you know, at a high level, like Istio's architecture is comprised of a few things. Um, the sidecar resource, which I've talked about you know, extensively, which is based off of Envoy. Now, there is something very interesting about that too. I'll talk about it very momentarily. So that sidecar is based off of Envoy, and then we have something called the ingress and egress gateway. So the ingress gateway is something that accepts and, and is listening in for communications on various ports, on various hosts. When it sees that, when it sees an inbound request, it'll route it to the appropriate resource. And then the appropriate resource will provide a response and then the ingress gateway will provide that response respectively to the requester. That ingress gateway today is based off of Envoy as well. Mm -hmm. So the other thing too, is there's something called an egress gateway, which means that you have services that need to communicate externally with something else. That egress gateway is gonna facilitate that external communication for your services inside of your cluster. And then the very last thing that, um, that we've talked about already is, is TOD, the control plane, which is responsible for the configuration, responsible for the certificate management, responsible for allowing you to scrape metrics using a Prometheus style format and then output that somewhere else. Um, but then outside of that, there are elements that I've talked about previously that allow us to be able to use all of these different tools, right? Um, the traffic management through virtual services and destination rules, and then yeah. even the security through um, pure authentication and authorization policies. But that's that's Istio's architecture um, in depth, right? There's also something else here. Now, what if you didn't want to use a sidecar? What if you still wanted Istio-like services without the sidecar? Well, mm -hmm. this is where something called ambient mesh comes into the mix here. So ambient mesh is a new mode of operation. Right now it's still sitting in alpha phase. So there's there's still some experimentation that's going on with it to make it better, make it much more production ready and even consumable, much more consumable. Yeah. Ambient mesh basically takes that sidecar capability and removes it from the actual pod. And it actually mm. splits that functionality up into something called Z tunnel, as well as something called a waypoint proxy. So I, I actually, slightly touched on this much earlier on around what the sidecar does. Now, Envoy itself is a very powerful router. It does layer four connectivity, layer three, four connectivity, as well as layer seven connectivity. So it's handling API requests and HTTP requests alongside, you know, traffic routing for TCP IP. Now, what's happened is with ambient mesh, we've taken that functionality and split it up into that Z tunnel and waypoint proxy which optimizes the flow of traffic, which means that if you have services that need to communicate with each other, that only need MTLS, that only need, you know, layer four capabilities, well, we use Z-Tunnel, which speeds up, you know, communications, removes the sidecar consumption of CPU and memory, um, and still gives you that traffic management and security. When you need layer seven policy, like for the ability to do authorization on HTTP-based operations or or something along those lines. When you want one object to do some, give it the option to do something to another object. Well, this is where the waypoint proxy comes in. So we have this interesting mechanism. Actually, I'll show it to you. So this ex, you know gives you a much better view of what this really means. Yeah. Um, let's go share, and we'll go over here. So under this ambient service mesh, right? If we can assume that all of these are our pods. Um, that are trying to communicate with each other, right? Mm. We have this one pod here that's app eight. It doesn't have a sidecar, but it's it's basically constructed to route its traffic towards this Z tunnel, which also behaves kind of like a CNI to a degree because it's rerouting traffic. Um, and then that Z tunnel will tunnel that traffic using MTLS. You can actually assume that the waypoint proxy may not be there if we're not doing layer seven policy. But let's just say we just go direct to another Z tunnel pod that detail pod terminates the tunneling mechanism and then carries that traffic request all the way to app D. If layer seven 
is required, then the waypoint proxy actually is that bump in the wire that has to do that layer seven analysis and policy enforcement. If it's not required, it's just D tunnel to D tunnel basically. Mm -hmm. Now, the very interesting thing here is that you see that there's identity here written in spiffy format. Now, this is the identity of service A, which is this app A right here. It's trying to communicate with the service app D, which is deriving its identity. The Z tunnel pulls its identity from app D. So that way we can create or construct this MTLS tunnel between these Z tunnel pods. So normally, right, if we go back a bit, these two services are directly communicating with each other using their Envoy proxies. In yeah. this case, they're actually going through the Z tunnel pod, which is no longer a sidecar. It's just now another resource that lives inside of your cluster that is routing on behalf of any one of these services and assuming the identity for it. So that's this new mode of operation, which actually lends itself to um, better operate, uh, operations with inside of, let's say, a microservices architecture, which means you can onboard a service mesh much quicker without having to worry about deploying a sidecar right away. Now, there are instances where a sidecar will still always be required because there are very interesting applications that exist. There might be PCI requirements. There might be any sort of compliance requirements or security requirements out there. And then there are instances where you don't need the sidecar. You can cut back yeah. on that um, CPU and memory consumption. Okay, that, that makes sense. I just want to understand uh, the, the problems with sidecar implementation a bit more. Uh, so if I understand, uh, initially each container would have its own sidecar and, you know, like the Envoy proxy. And now all these sidecars are, you know, kind of merged together and let's call it like a Z tunnel. Uh, what was the problem with sidecar? Was it just a deployment time it took because I have to deploy another container along with, but typically sidecars are like very small in size, right? Yeah, they are, they are very lightweight in size, but as you add more and more routing rules, more and more policies to it, it becomes very heavy, right? Which means yeah, it adds yeah. latency into processing time. But the other thing, the other consideration here is rolling out a sidecar. So let's just say you already operate an environment today with no sidecars, just you were running a Kubernetes environment, microservices, your applications are running fine, and then you decide you want to deploy a service mesh. Well, to deploy a sidecar, which means you have to actually inject the pod with a new container, which actually requires you to roll out, re-roll out your deployment, which means your, your containers go from one to two. Uh, but that can mean a little bit of a downtime, right? So that's one consideration. So actually there are two things, right? The consideration of downtime of rolling it out and the consideration of how much CPU and memory uh, a sidecar resource will actually consume. Now, in certain situations, this may not even be a problem for a lot of people that consume a service mesh in their microservice environment. Um, but in certain situations, let's say edge computing, right? might be a situation where you don't want to consume so many resources, but you still want sidecar-like capabilities at your, your cluster level. Um, yeah. The other thing too, right, with respect to rolling out and operationalizing something like a service mesh with sidecars, like I mentioned, you have downtime associated with rolling this out. With something like ambient mesh, it allows you to think maybe I can operationalize this a lot better and not have to worry about a, a downtime um, while deploying some of these service mesh entities like Z tunnel or the waypoint proxy. Now each, each deployment model is going to have its downsides, right? And upsides. Yeah. You know, yeah. the, the deployment model with the sidecar means you have routing right at the source of your application, which means you can make much better decisions, which means you have much more established trust. Zero trust becomes a lot more easier to see. Um, but then you also have more CPU and memory and even disk consumed. On the other hand, you know, ambient mesh, you know, addresses those particular concerns around CPU and memory, but there are trade-offs too, meaning you only have a single entity that handles a lot of these requests that come in and out. Um, and so that could become a single point of failure, but then that just becomes under the realms of Kubernetes and, and failure modes and operations and how it recovers too, right? So a lot of different ways to look at this. Um, there are companies out there that are also attempting to do the sidecarless approach as well. Um, okay. 
but it really comes down to what your particular needs are today and you know if security becomes very top of mind for you as well okay interesting uh help me understand uh z tunnel a little bit better so is it like a like a combination or like a fleet of containers or is it just one container what what is it and what if it goes down so it's funny um there you can actually take a lab today that lets you allow, allows you to play with ambient mesh um, and we actually offer this up at solo today so if you go to academy.solo.io you can find ambient mesh why i bring this up is you actually have access to a kubernetes cluster where you'll deploy ambient mesh once you deploy ambient mesh you actually get to see the architecture of ztunnel and you can actually do a describe of that ztunnel pod to see and find out mm -hmm. that oh by the way it's also running the istio proxy so the ztunnel okay. is the istio proxy now it's susceptible to failures just like any other pod would be in the given node if ztunnel yeah. failed it's not because the underlying code failed it's because the node it's running on probably failed ran out of memory ran out of cpu something happened to it network disconnect that's normally why these failures occur inside of a cluster. Um, it's usually something infrastructure related, right? Unless yeah. somehow, you know, there was another malicious service that happened to just scale up, use the HPA or something like that, the horizontal pod auto scaler and, and just I don't know, did a DLS or a denial of service kind of attack. But yeah. if a ZTL went down, right, what would Kubernetes do? Kubernetes would go back, honor the daemon set configuration of how how ambient mesh is deployed and redeploy that Z tunnel on another node that it's supposed to be on. Except because it's deployed as a daemon set, each node in your cluster already has a Z tunnel pod. Okay, got it. That that makes sense. Uh, basically, it means that you know, of course, there are trade offs of each of these designs, and. Uh, Z tunnel solves some of these problems, as you said, you know, the resource consumption on the pod itself uh, might be a little bit of an issue. Uh, but I, I want to understand, you know, if let's say you have too many configurations on the sidecar, uh, does that not mean that there is already a smell that you're talking to a lot of other services and maybe you, you have to do something different or like take a different perspective? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? So the only time you'll have a lot of configuration on your sidecar is if you haven't planned it out accordingly, right? Okay. You haven't truly established. There could have been a lack of maintenance as well in terms of, hey, you know, this service was talking to the service previously, but I forgot to remove the routing rules for it, right? Which adds to the bloat. So that's that's something that requires a level of, custom, like just maintenance in general of, Hey, I've rolled out yeah. a service mesh. I got to make sure that these services, once they get turned down, we take care of what goes on afterwards, right? Yeah. Um, but then the other thing too is the the actual sidecars themselves actually go out to find out about this information from STOD. They'll cache it for a short period of time because guess what? We need it to age out so that new information can come in quickly. Otherwise, we might be retaining or caching old information that actually may present a problem to the to the request flow in general. Yeah, yeah, I think that makes sense. Um, I think we have covered a lot of details on you know how Istio works, how, how at a high level how the architecture looks like, and also the new things like ambient mesh and what problems does it uh, does it solve. I want to ask you in your experience, what are the use cases that you have seen where you know uh, this has been used at a massive scale, for example. Yeah, the massive scale situation is when someone needs to establish zero trust in their in environment. That's probably one of the biggest use cases, right? Using mm. Istio to establish zero trust means that now um, a lot someone operating this at scale is able to control all of the different services. They have awareness into all the different services. They can catalog yeah. them for a matter. Cataloging your services, especially ones you didn't know about, is probably huge as well. Um, but in any case, right? Zero trust, basically going for that one single use case alone, despite the fact that you have all these other built-in capabilities, is why you know customers work towards a service mesh. They just want to make sure that one service trusts another. And then when you have this full mesh of communication going on, 
now you don't need to worry too much because now you do have some level of authorization and authentication put in place here. Um, one of the other use cases, the biggest use cases is using an API gateway. Um, if you're familiar with API management and, and how that all functions, sometimes if you have communications towards given APIs, you want to maybe rate limit them because you don't want to overload that service. Um, this yeah. is exactly what people will gravitate towards very, you know, initially, especially with a service mesh. In fact, the Istio ingress gateway is basically an API gateway at this point in time. Now, the only other thing, uh, I mean, there's so many other use cases too. For example, disaster recovery, right? Disaster recovery and disaster avoidance is a key use case when operating like a resilient microservices architecture. Um, load balancing, load balancing, even though it's kind of as part of that, just overall yeah. disaster avoidance strategy, the load balancing is something that, you know, a lot of people don't want to sit there and mess around with cloud provider load balancers and their particular configurations. They would rather yeah. much do this through Kubernetes um, and use something like Istio to drive a lot of those configurations as well. Um, the observability use case is huge, right? In fact, um, when we dive into that use case a lot, things like telemetry data, things like log data, things like, um, you know, just how the control plane is doing, performing, details, these details need to be somewhere, right? We need to be able to understand yeah. how our environment is doing. And quite honestly, we see folks deploying service meshes primarily just for that observability data alone. Because here's the other thing. So Istio, while it does provide like um, that Zipkin <laughs> and Jaeger format of data, there's also this element of open telemetry integration as well. It feeds yeah. that data into open telemetry using either Zipkin or Jaeger format. And now you can use an open telemetry collector to spit that out to another platform. And now you have much more, you know, information around what your system is doing. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, I, I think I, I have learned a lot, you know, uh, talking about all these, uh, different concepts and, you know, the new things that are happening, uh, as I, if correct me if I'm wrong, but ambient mesh is still under, you know, development alpha release. And, uh, is it, is it specific to Istio, what Istio is doing, or is it also available as a concept in different implementations? So it's, it's only available under the Istio framework at the moment. Um, in fact, I don't even know if it's alpha at this point, it might even be just so experimental. Um, Okay. If you actually go to the Istio GitHub page, there's a branch for Ambient Mesh, which hasn't been merged into the to the main branch yet. But yeah. in that branch, you can actually see um, you can actually see how to deploy it. You can also see what it comes with. You can also see um, just some of the like elements of like where it sits right now in terms of ready for production status, which it definitely isn't right now. Yeah, makes sense. Do I have to run my own Istio or do I also have like Istio as a service or something? So there may be companies out there that may attempt to do Istio as a service at some point in time, but here's the other thing too, right? At, at this point, we've seen more folks wanting to um, roll Istio on their own and then get enterprise support. Um, in fact, Solo will offer up enterprise support for Istio if you want, but here's the thing, like. Trying to run Istio alone by itself for one cluster is, is tough enough. When you try to do this for many, many clusters, it becomes very unscalable. So yeah. Solo has something called the Glue Platform, which inside of Glue Platform, there's something called Glue Mesh that actually abstracts Istio. So it actually saves you the hassle of having to configure resources across multiple clusters. The trust boundary is pre-established for you between, let's say you have a cluster here um, in the east side of the world where you have a bunch of applications and then you have another cluster running, I don't know, somewhere in the Antarctica. Um, and then you have one more cluster running in the Americas, right? Yeah. Um, now across these different clusters, glue mesh abstracts on top of there, right? So now you, you configure a single set of CRDs and you can configure some very good locality load balancing and do a whole bunch of interesting things where even within Istio, it's very complex to try and do manually by hand. Istio does, okay, let's back up a bit. If you try to do this with Envoy completely, good luck, have fun. <laughs> if you try to do this with Istio, it's achievable, but what you end up doing is having to trust every single object. Cluster one needs to trust cluster two. Cluster one's 
uh, resources need to cl trust cluster two's resources. And having to do this repeatedly is not very scalable. You could use GitOps to achieve this, but this is why glue mesh exists, right? This is okay. why Solo has glue mesh for you. Yeah, very interesting. Uh, is there a is there a limitation on Istio? Like, if I talk about so when we say Istio cluster, right? Is there a limitation or like a max uh, bound to having number of instances or number of pods in a in a cluster when it's time to you know split the cluster? Actually, I think that's always going to be a moving target, um, especially as Istio grows and evolves and whatnot. I, and quite honestly, maybe the the documentation might have the, the current figures as it stands. But Istio, because of the way it's built, can take quite a lot. It can okay. handle quite a huge amount of workloads. The, the number of workloads, I can't really say for sure, um, because like I mentioned, that, that target is always moving given how Istio yeah. is evolving consistently and it's being improved upon daily. Awesome. Great. I think I, I have learned a lot personally and I'm, I'm more curious to learn more. So for our viewers, I, I always ask, you know, our guests, what are the resources to learn more? So what, what are your recommendations? Let's say I have to learn more on microservices, the challenges, uh, more on service mesh, Istios. Um, are there some books? Are there some tech talks, resources available out there that you would recommend? There are many, many resources. I think one of the first things I would always recommend is just go to YouTube and, and honestly look up what is Istio. Any video that has a lot of views pro and probably a lot of likes is probably a good video to look at. Um, yeah. But quite honestly, that it, it, it's a very, you know, find your own pathway. Now, there are some books out there. There is actually one that the CTO of uh, Solo wrote. It's called Istio in Action. Um, mm. Go check it out. It's actually a very detailed book on the Istio service mesh. Now, that's a lot of reading, though. Like, if you don't like reading like me and you actually want to get your hands dirty, there's a number of ways. You can go to the Istio docs page, and there's a quick way to get started. Um, but, hey, let's just say you don't have the resources locally or you don't have a platform like a cloud provider to go test this out. Let me show you something. So we have something called Solo Academy. Solo Academy was built with the community in mind. Like you come here and you want to better understand how to work with APIs, learn about API management, how to work with an API gateway, how to work with services and service meshes, and even just Kubernetes networking. Well, you come here, right? And I will say there's actually gonna be one more course that gets added here that's actually even a step down from what you see here. It's more of a foundational networking, how to work with IP addresses, understanding the OSI model, understanding DNS, understanding HTTP operations, understanding what load balancers and proxies do, and even getting to the point where you understand networking namespaces and how containers communicate with each other to the point that you now arrive at Kubernetes networking. That will be up here very shortly. But if you want to learn more, right, you could start with the Istio courses. There's two of them right now where you get started with Istio and you can get a sense of how to roll Istio out for production. Then you can also get started with Cilium. So you understand some container networking fundamentals too, services networking, how we get to the point of policy and whatnot. And then there's a few other courses that you can augment yourself with as well. If you wanna learn more about Envoy, how that functions at a very basic level. This is very complex by the way, because Envoy is complex if you wanted to manually configure it yourself. Um, but these are all self-paced workshops you click them, you'll learn a little bit about them, and then you're given a lab environment where you actually can play with it hands-on. Very interesting. And it's all for free, so it's definitely- All for free. <laughs> Great, so yeah, community in mind. So that makes a lot of sense. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Marino, for you know joining us today and you know sharing all the interesting concepts and architecture uh, ideas on Istio, Service Mesh, and it's, it's very interesting. So uh, for our viewers, if you like this episode, please hit the like button, uh, subscribe to the channel and check out the, you know, Solo Academy or Istio Academy and learn more on the fundamentals to the advanced level uh, concepts. So I'm sure this episode is going to make our viewers more curious and make them, you know, make take their first step into cloud uh, native networking. So thanks a lot. And I hope you also enjoyed uh, our conversation today and I look forward to co collaborate with you more. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, 
One more thing, right? I, I also want to just share a couple of the things that I'm working on just so that you have an idea going forward if anyone is interested. Um, yeah. So I, I did mention I stream a lot, right? Um, and I stream just so that people get to see how I learn. I get to learn in public, but I also get to teach people at the same time. Um, I'm going to be digging into more Istio and security around things like authentication and certificate management. So I'm going to be working with someone from HashiCorp to talk about Istio and Vault integration. How do we work these two together so that we can understand secret management, certificate management, and whatnot? The second thing is um, there's the elements of authorization, right? How, how do we allow certain objects to do certain things to other objects or services? And quite honestly, um, I'm going to be inviting someone from Styra who's going to work with me alongside that to dig into how Istio and Open Policy Agent work together. And then um, something else that I'm working on, I'm actually working on another stream to demonstrate how Istio and Wasm or WebAssembly will work together as well. Now, as an extension of all of this, I, I decided I also wanted to build another workshop. I built one workshop called Network Foundations. I'm gonna be building another workshop that's gonna be focused in on Cilium and advanced networking. So if you are trying to better understand network communications with your pods and your containers, that workshop's gonna be for you. So that's where I'm at. I'll be speaking at a few other engagements um, throughout the rest of the year. Um, I'll also be at reInvent. So I'm looking forward to seeing you there if you're actually gonna be there. Um, that, that includes you, Kavalia. Um, <laughs> so I hope to see you there. Uh, and then next year, I'm looking forward to all the other speaking engagements and conferences that I'll be at. So uh, if, you're, if you're around, you know, come find me. Awesome. Yeah, thank you and looking forward to it. Thanks a lot. Yeah, no, thank you so much for having this podcast. I had a great time. I, I just want to say thank you all for listening. If you have any more questions, you know, you are welcome to reach out to me. Follow me on Twitter at virtualize6 with, uh, with a 6IX. Um, and yeah, I'll be around. Awesome. Thanks.